Jeff Rose Hartland is going to be our speaker here today. Uh, he's uh, an author and a productive young writer who's quite familiar with the ebook uh, game. And uh, he is, as they say, we're still till we get exhausted or have to leave today. Or kick me in. Eight p.m. No, I'm not here tonight. And I'd like to have the right off right now to start off by just going around the room so we know who we are facing this moment. I start over here. Who's the other person? Georgina Quarr, Judy Dixon, Laura Jackson, Emma Evans, uh, John Crelin, I'm guest of Rouse. <laughs> Thank you very much. Jeremy Sawyer, Bob Steele, and uh, over here, Esther Brown. Patricia O'Neill, sorry. Patricia O'Neill, Karen Sarah. Okay. And I'm Anderson, Carl Anderson, the fellow who met uh, together over the coffee shop, and you thought that I was somebody else. <laughs> and this other old man who walked out before you got there. <laughs> you know, it was me. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, first of all, um, well, I guess I should start at the very beginning. If you can't hear me, you can ask me to speak up. If I'm too loud, tell me to shut off by all means. Um, I, and I also want to thank Ralph and all of you for inviting me to come along and talk with us today. Uh, some of you may be thinking that I look fairly familiar. If you watch here and now, you've probably seen me on the news. I also advocate for veterans, and uh, I've been on the news a lot of times. So that should answer some of your questions right there. What uh, myself and Raoul decided to work out uh, for my address today, we've decided to split it into two sections. Uh, the first section we're going to deal specifically with the current state of the industry, and the second section will deal with uh, self-publishing, self-publishing as it's also known, uh, we'll be talking about print on demand and ebooks. We're going to do that in the second session. We'll have a short break in between. And uh, towards the end of each section, I'll uh, make time for your questions. So everybody can feel free to speak up then. Current state of the industry. Uh, it's in collapse. It's been in collapse for a long time. The beginning, probably the beginning of the end of the publishing industry as it had been known, goes back to about the mid-1990s. In particular, you may be familiar with the returns crisis of 1996. That was when, that year, 36% of books were returned from retailers to publishers, were returned unsold, with publishers having to absorb the cost of that. That had a significant negative financial impact on publishers and uh, really highlighted a problem with the deal, uh, with, with the concept of consignment as applies to the book industry. There are very few industries, uh, music being on the other one I'm aware of, there are very few industries where product sales are guaranteed or you can return it. So these can't return suit to Campbell's. But publishers can return books to, uh, booksellers can return books to publishers. The negative impact of that is that booksellers have no vested interest in selling because their costs are covered regardless. And that means they have no interest in promotion. Promotion over the past 10 or 15 years, publishers have been moving more and more out of the promotion field and leaving authors to do all of their own promotion themselves uh, to the point that authors are having to put the bill for their own book tours, have to have them to arrange their own book tours. Publishers, as of the last three to five years, the vast majority of book promotion done by publishers has been of books that are cross-media. They are celebrity books about reality TV stars. They are books about famous musicians. So basically, publishers are promoting books for people that don't need any publicity. The people that do need publicity aren't getting a look at. I should note before I'm much part of it that as I proceed through the state of the industry uh, conversation here, it is full of a lot of darkness and despair. 
thought that's only darkness and despair if you're a publisher. Or if you're somebody that's specifically in the business of manufacturing and distributing books. As a writer, this is a very good time. A lot of doors can open for us. So while this may seem very negative, it is actually quite good for us as writers. Um, the, the book returns crisis and pricing issues have left publishers completely victimized by the winds of retailers. As independent bookstores started declining in the uh, late 90s, they were getting bought up by mega corporations like Chapters and by big box retailers such as Costco and Walmart. The big box retailers don't have an interest in books as a product. So they've been demanding higher and higher share of the cover price and lower and lower cover prices. Publishers have had to comply or not, or, or would not be in presence in the big box retailers. The end of the loss of independent bookstores and the replace of them with, with uh, national chains means that big publishers are getting shelf space. Independent publishers, boutique publishers, and individuals are not getting shelf space. If they do get shelf space, it's usually tucked away in the back corner somewhere in a massive store and you gain no comment. The other thing that's been happening with the uh, publishing industry, these next couple of things the publishing industry denies, but the reality is, is undebatable. Since the turn of the millennium, publishers have not been fostering talent. They don't go find a new writer, encourage them to write, work on them with their first couple of books, knowing that that writer is going to become a major talent later on. What they replaced it with, at least for the, the major publishing houses and most of the mediums, is not only do they not find talent, they won't even talk to writers. They only deal with agents. In Canada, last time I checked, there were nine literary agencies. The agencies do not want to speak to a first-time writer. They want somebody who has a publishing history. So if you already have four books out, you can get an agent, provided your sales were good. If you're a first-time writer on the first novel, no matter how well it did, or how critically acclaimed, the agents don't want to talk to you. Because the agents don't want to talk to you, the publishers will not talk to you. Which means you cannot break into the industry. Just checking my notes here. Uh, the publishing industry, as of this date, is still trying to force markets instead of finding them. What that means is that they decide that in two years, vampire fiction is going to be really popular. So they go out and they find some people that write vampire fiction and they invest $100 million promoting a stable of vampire fiction. And it sells because of the promotion. Not because of quality, not because of artistry, not because of market demands, but simply because they created a demand for it. They deny, the publishers deny that that's what they do, but in fact, when you look at the sales records and the promotion records, you'll see that that has been what's happening. Exceptions to this are Dan Brown and J.K. Rowling neither of whom were fostered by publishers or overly promoted by publishers until they were already popular. And what the downside of that is what what you would expect to happen would be that publishers would go out, gauge the market, see where they're starting to begin an interest and try and fill that need in six or eight months. But they're not doing that. So they're talent recruitment is non-existent, their research and development is non-existent, they're relying solely on their, uh, on their advertising department to force a market. The problem with that is that the consumer ends up being extremely frustrated with buying an endless series of supposedly popular novels, getting them home, getting three chapters in, and this is garbage. I just wasted 15 bucks. 
I'll be discussing uh, consumer disenfranchisement more shortly. One of the other major issues that publishers have had to confront over the past five years and completely failed to do so is the advent of e-publishing in the e-book. The first e-book reader, was, the first official e-book reader, was released to market in 1992. It was called the Sony Bookman. And uh, it ran on a floppy disk. Mm -hmm. You may recall, as uh, the internet became popular towards the end of the 90s, uh, there was also a change in the book industry in that, especially with reference material and in particular encyclopedias, they stopped putting out print volumes and started putting them out on CD. That was really the first time that electronic books became popularized. And the industry had an opportunity then to start looking for the future, which they failed to do. Incidentally, the e-ink technology, which is the uh, black text on the white screen that you see on devices such as the Kindle, that technology has been around since the 80s. So it's not like this uh, came out of nowhere and, and surprised them. They have had plenty of time to adjust to this. In 1990, uh, sorry, in 2006, Amazon released the Kindle, which was the first mainstream popular electronic book reader. At the time, the top publishers did not have any electronic books available, had no plans to release anything electronically, and to a large extent, for the first year, denied that there was ever going to be an ebook industry. That pre uh, provided a lot of good opportunity for us, and that it allowed writers to sidestep the publishing industry completely, interact directly with Amazon, and release our material that they had been sitting on shelves for years because we couldn't get a publisher. It took three years before the top publishing houses began to release books in ebook form. By that point, a market had already been created for ebooks, and a means of meeting consumer demand had already been created in the form of uh, ebook publishers, which I'll talk about a bit more specifically in the next section. And the need for publishers as gatekeepers began to erode dramatically because consumers were discovering they could go and get free ebooks by somebody that they'd never heard of and really enjoy it. And because publishers weren't promoting, they were having the consumers were left having to go out and find their own readable material anyway. So finding it online by sifting through pages of books which may or may not interest them was no different than going to a bookstore and spending four hours in, in there and coming up with nothing. And the final thing that has brought the publishers to crisis is their approach and overreaction to ebook platform privacy. When talking about electronic formats and the state of publishing, we frequently need to look back at what happened with the music industry during the same time period with uh, Napster, MP3 players, and piracy, which they're still arguing about. What happened with music publishing, or with the music business, is that little devices came out, little portable devices that would hold a thousand CDs, and consumers loved them and wanted to put a thousand CDs on them. And the music manufacturers said, no, we're not going to do that. So along came Napster, which said, well, hey, we can share our, share our own collections online. And that's what people did. Not because they're criminals, not because they, they wear eye patches and they stole them crossbones flags, but because they wanted material to put on their device. The response of the music industry was to take those people to court. Napster was shut down and replaced almost instantly by Apple iTunes, a legal, a legal way to download music, which was something the music industry should have done right from the beginning and didn't. What we're seeing now with ebooks is exactly the same issue. A new device came out, consumers love it, there was nothing to put on it. So then they went out and they found stuff. 
And then the publisher is drafted by jumping up and down and shouting, you can't do that, that's theft. There's a very important episode from the music industry and their fight against Napster and privacy that's particularly relevant to what's happening in publishing. At the time that the music industry was trying to get Napster shut down, they had a stable of musicians who were coming out and declaring that music piracy was going to destroy the music business, there'd never be any more music made, and so on. One of the most popular artists to come out at the time, and one of the faces that we saw on every press conference for a while, was Britney Spears. She was at the heights of her career, and she insisted that if people downloaded her music and didn't pay for it, then she would not have a career. Well, she doesn't have a career. But that's not because of privacy, that's because of low quality. Because Britney Spears was a manufactured act. An act that was only successful because of the mass media machine behind her and the hundreds of millions of dollars spent encouraging people to buy her record. And as soon as the record company stopped spending a hundred million dollars to promote Britney Spears, she went away. At the exact same time Britney Spears was on all the news screens, Johnny Cash released a single. And this was uh, probably about two years before he died, two years before he died. He released a cover version of a song by a heavy industrial band. The song's name was Kirk, the band he covered with Nine Inch Nails. Johnny Cash did this rock song as a Johnny Cash country band. And the record companies hadn't been promoting Johnny Cash very much over the years because they didn't need to. At the time, Johnny Cash was signed to American Recordings, and almost all of his back catalog was out of production. So, why the Sam Clinton, all of his music from, from the 50s and 60s was all out of print. You couldn't get it. But this new single comes out. And all of a sudden, a whole bunch of teenagers, heavy, heavy, heavy rock people with makeup and funny hair and facial piercings, discovered Johnny Cash. And they started downloading the music, what they could get their hands on. And within three months, Columbia Records, who owned all of Johnny Cash's back catalog, released all of Johnny Cash's back catalog. They brought 15 albums back into production. They're still in production today, and they're selling well. Because a bunch of teenagers pirated Johnny Cash's music. So there we have the contrast between music downloading as theft and music downloading as a promotional tool. And that's particularly relevant to what's happening with ebooks right now. The publishing industry in an effort to hang on to the sand that's running out of its fingers and to try and maintain their business model and, the, and in their refusal to admit that there's any problems going on are pointing fingers at ebooks saying that's all pirated. Everything that you download for free is pirated and you're a criminal. But it's even less believable in the publishing industry because the backbone for consumers of discovering new books has always been libraries and borrowed from friends. So when the publishing industry starts saying, you stole that book because you downloaded it, it's a lot less believable because, well, if I didn't download it online, I borrow it from Ralph because he's been trying to own it to me for a month. The publishing industry, as it stands, has failed to react, to, to react to any of the challenges presented over the past 20 years. It is in serious decline. It has no plan for addressing the future of publishing as a business. The only approaches that they've taken, as proven over the past five, six years, their only approach is to blame other people, to degrade the product, and to try and get governments to regulate control of the industry back to 
what they had enjoyed in the 80s. The fault with the client of the publishing industry is the publishing industry itself for failing to embrace writers and for failing to recognize consumer demand. Consumer disenfranchisement, which is really the driving force behind the decline in the writing industry, um, it it's, goes back to the 80s with price. As technology has improved over the past 30 years, prices have gone up, not down. When the process of manufacturing a book has become easier, consumers know this. And they're looking at the $45 hardback and the $20 paperback, and they're not willing to pay for that. They're also frustrated with the lack of variety, which is the fault of retailers. Big box retailers and uh, mega chains want guaranteed sales. They don't want four copies of something, they want four pallets of something. So when you walk into one of those stores, any of those stores, you can go to four or five of them in the course of the day and see exactly the same books in every store with very little difference. Are, consumers are also frustrated with lack of literary quality. When there is a promotion of a certain book, something comes out on the Oprah Book Club or something from one of the publishers that's being hyped, they go, they buy it, they bring it home. It's garbage. Why did I buy this? I bought it because someone showed me an ad. So I was, they feel victimized by that. The big thing that the publishing industry has has given away if they even ever had it, which I did. They created a myth called the gatekeeper. The myth is that publishers are the ultimate judge of what is worth being put on paper. They are the ones that are fit to determine quality and determine what should be out there and what's fit for you to read. And it's a myth that we all bought into. It's a myth that they dramatically shattered over the past few years, but it is still a myth that they're trying to promote. So the idea is that if you get, if you are put out by a publisher, then you are worthy of being called a writer. If, on the other hand, you do it yourself and put it out as an e-book or a print-on-demand publication, or in previous years you paid someone to print it, well. You just can't accept the fact that you can't write. That's all you are. This is the gatekeeper myth. The publishing industry shattered this myth very, very dramatically in the past few years. Here's some examples. But bear in mind, I'm not talking about any specific one publisher. These are generalities and the industry as a whole. In 2010, Chantal Allen is published via the University of uh, Alberta Press a nonfiction book called Bomb Canada and Other Unkind Remarks in the American Media. It was self published. The e book is still available out there for free download. It won the 2010 Alberta's Reader's Choice Award. It was voted by thousands of readers as being the best book. She couldn't get a publishing deal. She still doesn't have a publishing deal. Terry Fallis, The Best Laid Plans. Uh, he put it out as print on demand via our universe, who are listed on the handout. Um, and the reason for that was he couldn't get a publisher interested in this book. It won the Stephen Leacock Award. And then it won Canada Reads. Even after it had won the Leacock Award, it still took them six months to get a publishing deal from the people who claim that they are the ultimate arbiters of literature. Uh, here's two more that you will probably be familiar with. Joanna Skibsworth, if I may have to mispronounce her name, wrote a book called The Sentimentalists. Uh, it was rejected by major houses, and she ended up signing with the boutique press in the Brunswick uh, press that put out uh, a maximum of 1,000 books a week. They did an initial one of 800. She won the Giller Prize 
The week after she won the Giller Prize, you could not buy a copy of her book anywhere in Canada because her, her publisher could not meet market demand. It took three months for her to get a deal worked out with a distributor and a printing house to get enough copies of the book out to meet market demand. Another one that could not find, uh, that could not get a contract with the gatekeepers in the publishing industry. And finally, the hot one this month, E.L. James, Fifty Shades of Grey, is released as an e-book and a print-on-demand paperback in May of 2011 by a group called the Writer's Coffee Shop, which is a virtual publisher based in Australia. It's a writer's collective. As you now know, it's the top-selling book in most of the Western world right now. But initially, no contract offers from any publishers. Now, to contrast that, here's what the publishers, the gatekeepers of literature, have been doing and have been awarding contracts to. In 2010, Random House signed model Tyra Banks to a three-book deal for three teen fiction books, the first one of which is Model Land that just came out. Justin Bieber, age, 2010, uh, age 16 in 2010, signed two separate book deals for his biography, which I imagine started day one, fired from the movie. <laughs> and Snooki Polizzi, of the Jersey Shore reality program, if you're not familiar with it, and if you're not, you know, just consider yourself lucky. <laughs> In 2009, Snooki on Twitter posted that she had just finished reading her first book. Twelve months later, Simon and Schuster signed her to a book deal. So that's what the gatekeepers of the publishing world have been doing. Award winners, even after they win awards, can't get contracts, but very literal people can't. That is why consumers are fed up with publishers and why writers are fed up with publishers. And the end result of that is opportunity for writers. Mm -hmm. It's created a very different situation for modern writers. The modern writers now have the ability to very cost effectively release the material. Um, for example, my novel is here. Total cost to get that to print, not counting the writing time, 50 bucks. And that's a bound book in your hand. If you want to put it out as an e-book, possibly nothing. And you can have your book there. Currently, publishers are sliding off the uh, self-published writer, saying, well, your book wasn't worth putting out, that's why you didn't get a publishing deal. You're just so vain that you need to have your material out as opposed to revising and revising and revising. Publishers fail to grasp the fact that there's an awful lot of writers out there that can't get agents, but have won awards and can't get a book in. I'm one of them. And I already have proof that somebody with supposed literary authority thinks my work is good and worthy of publication. So when a publisher tells me it's not, then clearly one of those two is wrong. And clearly, in the case of the publishing industry, it's the publisher. Because they gave Tyra Banks a contract. <coughs> so, here's the good news for us. We all have stacks of material we have, most of which is probably ready for print. We have articles written for magazines, short stories written for magazines that were never accepted. The magazine industry entered a crisis in the 90s, and right now there's a handful of literary publications in Canada, and none of them pay. Or if they do, I think maybe one pays or two pays, and most of them don't. Short story magazines don't exist much anymore. Um, they are coming back, something for second, for part two. 
But we have volumes of material. We have books that were <coughs> that aren't available anymore. We have stories that never made it to press, but could have. We have stuff that did make it to press five, ten years ago that was read in a very small area. All of this material sitting on our hard drives, sitting on our bookshelves. Right now, you can take it and you can put it out. You don't need a publisher. You don't need an agent. You don't need the approval of somebody who's capable of giving Snooky a, a publishing deal. You don't need somebody to pat you on the head and tell you your work is good. You know your work is good. You've been doing it for a long time. You work hard at it. You can tell, as with all of us, when what you wrote yesterday is complete crap. And when you do, you can't put on the garbage. <laughs> so you know the difference between good work and bad work. And you don't need the support of a publisher to tell you that. You can put your work out there and let the audience decide. And the audience is there. Since the global economic crisis in 2008, readership is up dramatically. We are experiencing probably the highest rates of consumer readership that there's been since the 40s or 50s. But the market's not being served by the publishers, because the publishers don't listen to the consumers. Where are the consumers? Consumers are on their iPhone, at the Kindle store, looking for what's new now. You can be one of them. In the handout that uh, Rawlinson sent around and handed out here today, there are some essential links that I'll be referring to in the next section. The links that are contained on there under DIY Publishing, you can go home tonight with those links, and in a matter of four to six hours, you can have a sh something under 5,000 words available to the general public. That's where we are. So all of this crisis in the publishing world is a great deal of opportunity for us because we no longer have to wait for agents or rejection letters or the rejection letter that's not coming. We can simply grab a little by the horns and go out and find our audience. There's seven billion people on the planet. Any one of us would be happy if a thousand of those would come and read one of our stories. And we can, we can make that happen. Any questions? Is there any possibility <coughs> that you can find out through an ebook publisher if a book that you have with John Leonard is mostly done, if, if it would interest them so that you could either continue with it or drop it? Um, there are a couple of websites. There's one in particular called um, Ophthonomy.com. What is it? Ophthonomy. A U T H. O N O M Y um, dot com. And they're actually a subdivision of <coughs> McClellan and Stewart. And what it is, it's an online writing community where you can post samples of your work, your work in progress, your work that's completed, as little or as much as you want. And people can read it online for free and tell you what they think. If you're open to accepting criticism of people that um, may be particularly nasty in their reviews, uh, you, you can find out what people think. And that's probably a much better gauge than the opinion of a handful of people at a publishing house. So you can get a couple hundred people read your book and say, yes, it's good, no, it's not, yes, I'd buy this, no, you should you should take up crowns or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, they can be mean, but most of them are fairly polite. There's that's not the only site by any means. There, there there's a host of them out there that will look at your material and give you an opinion. If you're a poet, I understand there's a number here. Poetry has because of the decline in the popularity of poetry, which began probably around the time rock and roll started to increase, because I think those two are connected. Uh, but because poetry has been declined for so many years, poets and poetry communities have been, have 
been around and on the ground for decades. Now, with changes in technology, they're going more mainstream. Poetry has become popular again. There's a lot of poetry sites out there. There's a lot of uh, poetry sites that publish and that do reviews and all sorts of things. So if you are a poet and you'd like feedback or you're interested in getting your work out there, you need to get online because that's where they are. And you'll, you'll be amazed at how many people there are that appreciate poetry and the right poetry. What was payment for all this? You mean the, what you pay or what you get? Oh, uh, both. Okay. Uh, for ebooks, usually you don't have to pay much, if any. The what you might have to shell out for are the things that normally a, a publisher would pay for. So, if you're doing a book. You take my advice if you're going to put out a book, get a proofreader because you can't proofread your own 60,000 words as I've discovered. Um, but so you may have to pay a small fee for somebody to edit your, or proof your work if you can't get a friend to do it for free to shop and point it out. Um, well, please don't underestimate the abilities and the contribution of the editors. Oh, <laughs> not at all, not at all. Um, the, There's more than two. <laughs> the uh, cost of doing the cover depends on your abilities. Um, my cover cost me nothing. I took the pictures. My brother's girlfriend did the assembly work. If you know your way around one of the photo editing programs like Photoshop, you can do the cover yourself. It won't cost you anything. If you do have to pay somebody for it, it could cost you anywhere up to, up to a couple of probably up to fifteen hundred bucks if you hire a professional photographer to do the, the do the pictures. But again, it depends on how much work you're willing to put in versus your amount of skill and what you're what you're willing to pay for. And for that matter, I mean Penguin built the pay, the paperback on next to nothing on the cover. You know, name title. You can do you can do that in work in Microsoft Word or any other word processor. Don't need, don't need pictures at all. In terms of publishing, there's two different models. I'll get a bit more into this in the next section. But basically, print on demand, which is the hardcover print book, cost me 50 bucks. So when e you say cost you 50 dollars, do you mean that if you're selling that book, you have to charge 50 dollars? No, I mean getting it into a print form cost me 50 dollars. I had to pay for um, a copy of proof. And I had to pay, I think it was $10 membership fee to sign up. The cost of production is recouped from sales. Again, I'll, just, I'll go into the specifics of that in that section. If you're putting something out in an electronic form, again, you may have to shove out for editing, cover, whatever, whatever it is you want your book to look like. Um, but you don't necessarily have to do that. You can put your work out for nothing. Rates of return vary because you have price control. So you can decide that you don't want to receive any royalties from your book, just cover costs. In which case, it would work like that. Um, for ebooks, you can get material away for free. You can charge, well, I think the iStore makes you charge a dollar, but for a while, you can charge 10, 15 cents per short story. Um, longer for a novel. There's been some huge debates in the industry and massive fights over price control. Uh, Amazon twice has completely delisted publishers in order to win the fight. Publishers were saying, no, price for the ebook must be this. Amazon said, no, it's going to be lower. Publishers said, well, we refuse to do business with you. Amazon said, fine, the following day, yank yeah, all of that publisher's titles from the entire website. Thousands of books unavailable. The publishers crumble. Amazon gets its way. That's on the publishing business side of the fight. When it comes to the author side, you can charge as much or as little or nothing. You can get great return 
varies depending on which company you go with, but generally for in publication, you keep 70 to 80 percent. Do your strictures extend to local publishers and Newfoundland is? I'm just curious what you think of the local publishing scene. My personal experience with the local publishing scene has not been good. Um, because of that, <coughs> I am not connect, well connected with the local publishing scene. And I wouldn't like to speak to my opinion of them because it would be very much biased. Um, I can say, unbiased, that a lot of the major industry problems are affecting the Newfoundland publishers. I haven't seen, there, this may have changed because the publishing changes daily, but I have yet to see any publishers in Newfoundland release electronic versions of the book. Are you trying to start to then that would be, I guess that would be reasonable. Yeah, within the past year, I think they've talked about three or four times that they were reading out. Right, so that would put them five years, <laughs> five years later. Yeah, uh, well, that would be expected. Janet Russell has, uh, Janet Russell has writing the books and writing the books yes. that um, audio versions of books, and that's been a very successful small yes. business that she Yes, I've I've well, I wouldn't it. say very successful in any time I've been Well I've been watching it for a while. Not usually financially successful. No, but she very very much much of it these days because of it. Yeah. But she's also busy in another herself. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Are you distributing your own book? That is one of the problems with the IMR. Distribution. Well, that's one of the problems we had in Newfoundland anyway. We had sure. one distributor. Right. And well, he's a pain to work with. Yeah, I'm aware of that. <laughs> <laughs> because I want to put my books in places and, and like in the gift shops, and they say no, it has to go through this particular distributor. Mm -hmm. Do you like stepping in the I want a young person to start a new distribution company and give them a little bit of a... Well, as we'll, uh, as we'll learn in the next section as I get into the nuts and bolts of print on demand publishing, book distribution in terms of trucking books back and forth to retailers um, is probably going to be a completely outmoded process in about five years because of the change in technology. Um, the other thing is that, why, in my opinion, and so you can take back what it's worth, but <coughs> in my opinion, the um, the off-the-shelf market in gift stores and urban stations and so on, as a writer, you un undeniably you will sell copies of your book in that venue, but when you measure it against the amount of effort that's involved in maintaining accounts, getting your books out there, following up, and so on, you probably would end up finding that you're not actually making any money through that. And you, in all likelihood, would find that you could do it cheaper and more profitably if you embrace the online market and spent your time doing online promotion instead of going through the heritage shops and so on. That's my opinion. There are a lot, lots of people have different opinions on distri non distribution. How do you dis distribute your book? Uh, I took a handful of them. I went to Coles and Avalon Hall. They took four. I went to Tactors. They took ten. And uh, so you did it yourself. I did it myself. And they didn't say the decision would be made in front, huh? No. No. No, but if you take it to the Heritage Bookstore, and if you take it to the Heritage Shop, that's a different. They say they have a committee that has to have the book. That's right. right. That's right. Yes. So they don't get it in there. Right. 
If, if uh, chapter 77, you go back. Yes. Yeah. There's the consignment clause, uh, the consignment contract is extremely intimidating and completely unfair. 45 days. And an industry standard. Yeah. If the book is stolen, Chapters doesn't have to pay for it. If it's damaged, Chapters doesn't have to pay for it. Um, I've even heard that some not so reputable retailers invite you in for a book signing, get you to sign a bunch of books so that they can put them on the shelf, and then when you go back, they hand them back to you and call them damaged because you signed them. Um, Basically, I, my background prior to getting into publishing, my background was in the music industry. And the music industry is a cesspool. And the publishing industry is maybe one yard over. <laughs> you know, there, the shadiness that goes on in the, in the business of it is really nasty. And the thing that's particular, if the publishers were honest, if they came out and said, we're a business. We're in a business. We're in the business to make money. If we think this book is going to sell, we're going to buy it. If we think this one isn't, we're not going to. People could accept that. You know, you could accept the fact that your book on salt, which is one I saw earlier this week, may not have a wide market appeal, and therefore a publisher would be interested in it. Fair enough. But that's not what the publishers do. The publishers say, we're the guardians of the literary world. Your book on salt is not worthy of print. And so then you as an artist go home devastated. And that's where the problem was. Publishers don't admit that they're in it for business. And any time you're listening to a publisher talk, if you start hearing lots of phrases about the quality of the work and um, knowing the audience and so on, then you know that they're full of it. You can take anything else you hear in that interview and throw it away because they're not being honest they're lying to you. Can I just ask what you do with a publisher when they seem to have unilaterally decided not to go on printing? I'm talking about a children's book that had three print printings yeah. and the last royalty thing came in at $11 and I thought, hmm, uh, you know, you don't expect it make a living from things like this, but you expect about a hundred dollars maybe yeah. every half year. So I start looking around, it's nowhere to be found. Mm -hmm. Third printing has sold out and that's it. They're not really printing. Well. So, you know, it was a slow but steady sell before. Now it can't be found and people come to me asking why it's the story is. What I would suggest in particular Review your publishing contract. Make sure, obviously, you only an intellectual property right, but you have to check on printing rights. Assuming that you that with the la with it being out of print, that's a lapse in the contract. Everything uh, defaults back to you, and you own the copyright. Mm -hmm. I would um, take your royalty statements and talk to a different publisher, or you can, if you have the money to invest, you can do a short run at Dixon Co. of a couple of hundred, and distribute them yourself. And, above all, what I would do is check your contract, see who owns the electronic printing rights, assuming that your publisher does not hold the electronic printing rights, get it online as soon as possible. Because children's literature is extremely popular. They have ebook readers for kids that are designed with bigger screens or big friendly pictures. And there's a, not very many kids' books available for them. If you get your book into the Amazon ebook, in the Amazon Kindle store as a children's book, an illustrated children's book, you will probably do very well in a fairly short order. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If, if a children's book, uh, I, my children's book was published in 1987 and it was remaindered with um, 
Great water and Jesperson Press merged some years ago. And I bought the remainder, so they gave me an option and I chose to buy them. And <coughs> the interesting thing is that every year from the Public Lending Rights Commission, I get a check for sort of between $150 and $200 a year for this small volume, 112 pages, that was published in 1987. And at a nickel per borrowing, which the library gives the author, it means that the book is still going <coughs> out in Canada several thousand times a year, and it's continuing at a very regular rate. I get that check every year, which meant that across the country, wherever libraries had it, it's being borrowed, but in <coughs> St. John's, they decided not to continue to publish new editions of it, so right. it's, it's run its course. So do I have the right now to take that book and offer it to an e-book publisher? And yes. Because in 1987, your contract would not have included electronic rights. <coughs> electronic print rights only started coming into publishing contracts in the okay. mid-90s. And they never gave me an update on the contract. Right. So, so if, you're not, if your work is under contract with the publisher, you need to check. If your work is no longer under contract because the contract has run out, then it's yours. You can do it as you want. If your work was, if the contract created the inclusion of electronic rights, you can put it out electronically however you want. The only issues you may run into, which is something you definitely need to check, is issues regarding uh, the copyright on cover art and in the case of children's books with illustrations. If the illustrator and you sign together, then you should be fine. But if the illustrator was hired by the publisher, then you may have copyright issues. Okay, anybody else with questions with the industry? Mm -hmm. One last question. Yeah, I have one. Are you on the chapters list? I am. I'm on the website. How do you get on the list? On the website? I got on the list. No, the list. If you want to order a book. From yeah. chapters, you have they have to have it on their list. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. How do you get it on that list? Uh through the print on demand publishers. I see. So they're they're called publishers, but really they're printers is what they are. And they get you on the um Indian's book list and ultimately eventually you get picked off by the chapters list. It takes a while. You know, what last question? Oh, no, just you have to apply. Yeah, it, it's a bit complicated. You can't just, that's not something you can push through yourself. Okay. Is this the higher rate of readership now? Yes. Is that because the publishers are promoting books for people who don't need promoting? No, the higher rate of readership comes uh, largely because there's a number of factors. The big one that everyone can agree upon is the global economic downturn means that uh, more people have less money for entertainment. So the $500 a month cable bill is dispensed with. Um, the video game bill, all of these things they had been paying for for entertainment, they got rid of. And they started rediscovering libraries because they didn't have any money. And what's happened from that is like, oh wait a minute, now I can go buy a book for five bucks, or you know, in the case of ebooks, I can buy a dozen books for five bucks. And reader, the readership is up dramatically since 2008, but it had already been climbing before that. I blame the other contributing factors being a, a general decline in quality across all media forms, television, movies, uh, and music have all been suffering in, from the general lack of quality since the late 90s. Maybe because the book clubs took. And Maybe the growth of book clubs has been a contributor as well. It has been a contributor, and the growth of book clubs in particular shows um, the challenges that consumers have been facing in finding a book. So what they've done is they formed book clubs where they've gotten together and they bought one book, and on chapter three they can all go, this is trash. 
And then someone else can bring a new book and they go, oh, this is good. And then one member from this book club talks to another book club and says, hey, we just read this one over here and it was fantastic. So what's happening is readers are networking together, doing their own word of mouth promotion. And that is not only increasing readership, it's also increasing interest in specific titles, Fifty Shades of, of Grey, the most notable one currently because so almost all of the promotion of that initially was gone as word of mouth. Okay. All right. We'll take a, a break for a while to keep it. Five or ten minutes. Five or ten minutes. Then we'll come back and we'll all about this lovely world of do-it-yourself publishing. <laughs>